Hi, this is Guy Wallace, and I'd like to walk you through my nine-page uh, customer and stakeholder interview guide as uh, part of an intake process for instructional systems design, training and development, learning and development, learning experience design. Pretty much all the same things, in my mind, anyway. Um, so the first page uh, wants to gather some background. Now, all of this leads to an eventual project plan of some level of detail or not. I usually have a very detailed project plan and a separate proposal. But this document that I'm gonna walk you through aligns specifically with the sections of a project plan as I use them. So the first thing we wanna understand is who's the customer? You know, What's their names, their job titles? What organization do they represent? Uh, who are other potential sponsors? you know, their names and titles and organizations, uh, who are the key stakeholders, and again, the same kind of information. Um, we want to then get some sort of a, a, a documentation of the problem or opportunity statement. You know, why would we be doing this? Why would we be doing this now? So the who, what, where, why, and how, because the requester normally comes with some uh, concept in mind in terms of how they want this treated and of course they're probably approaching you because they want uh, training instruction learning uh, some learning experience and so that's what they're expecting um, and so rather than push back right then we just continue the intake process to make sure that we understand it and of course that often involves a lot of active listening so summarizing testing understanding seeking information etc um, now is not the time to push back on, you know, a preconceived notion that this is going to involve uh, a knowledge and skill deficit uh, or that uh, training, instruction, job aids, etc. are the solution. Um, so we want to know the who, what, where, why, and how regarding the symptoms of this so that we can understand, you know, what's at the root of this. Now I have a saying that uh, uh, training requests or requests for instruction for new hires should be expected. Requests for instruction to solve problems should be suspected. But again, we're going to defer our um, skepticism, if you will, and simply do intake of information about what the request is and what it's all about. So what are the key metrics, measures uh, required that are that would be affected by addressing this? What would we see, whether that's at the top level uh, business metrics on somebody's dashboard or whether this is a uh, uh, some measurement data that then in feeds to some broader uh, higher level metric um, again that always depends so we might be dealing with uh, uh, turnover we might be dealing with uh, productivity issues such as yield scrap rates etc um, costs of performance the length of time of performance so you know, what does the requester think? And of course, if they don't know because they're a middleman, middlewoman, if you will, uh, bringing the request to you, then then there's going to be others. And that's why we've gathered information about the uh, other sponsors or the key stakeholders so that we can begin to dig for what uh, metrics would we affect if we were successful if, that's a big if, if instruction was needed because the uh, root cause of the issue is a knowledge and skill deficit. And of course, new hires have that generally coming in the door. But to solve a performance problem, we might find that there's other things at the root uh, that might involve then instruction uh, to support the implementation of other interventions, non-instructional interventions, if you will. So we want to understand, you know, get the words from the requester about how will solving the problem benefit the uh, the company uh, or some functional organization, stakeholders, downstream customers, upstream suppliers, who? Um, and is this solution being prescribed by the customer? Um, are they flexible and receptive at all? And so we want to get a, 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 a take on that, you know, whether or not they've already made up their minds and then that might become an issue later on, or that they're open to whatever will solve their problem and they've just come to us because there's nobody else to go to in the enterprise. Continuing with the background and information uh, gathering on page two of this nine page document is the situational background. So, you know, what's, what is the background to this? What's led up to this? Why are they coming to us now? 
uh, you know, why not earlier, why not later, um, uh, what other initiatives uh, and, and things that might be going on in the organization that might uh, hinder us doing our effort, or is this our effort in support of some broader initiative? So we want to understand that kind of background. Um, what, what specifically should the project accomplish? Again, you know, it's we're trying to capture their words, not put it in our words, not put it in the, some three-part behavioral objective, if you will, but wanting to understand in the voice of the requester, you know, what are they asking for? Um, again, what would success criteria look like? Not everything is dollarizable. Um, not everything may have a direct impact on some specific business measure that's being tracked right now. Again, we're just trying to get a general sense from the requester, not being, not pushing back, not being negative about the fact that they're coming to us with a request, and certainly not uh, disabusing them if they don't know the answers to everything. Because again, they could be some middle person here bringing the requ request to us on behalf of someone else, and we want to understand all that. And continuing to the third page, again, more project overview. You know, what's the plan for conducting an evaluation? Do they have even thought about that? Who will conduct a post-effort uh, assessments, evaluations of success or not? Is that even something that they've talked about? Yes or no is the answer. Um, if, if training would be the uh, solution or part of the solution set, you know, how is that going to be uh, developed and deployed? Um, you know, who else might they see already as being as part of the effort? Do they have, you know, might this be a coaching effort and who would be the coaches? Uh, do they have uh, instructors that they would uh, supply to delivery, deliver any kind of instruction? You know, what are the, again, what are their thoughts? Um, from a developmental planning standpoint, who are the uh, subject matter experts or master performers that might be involved. Now, I like to focus on master performers, but there's certainly a, a time and a place for other subject matter experts. The master performers may be following some set of procedures and rules that are being dictated behind the scenes, so to speak, by you know regulatory issues, laws and regulations and codes, uh, but they may not know exactly you know what that's all about. So maybe somebody from regulatory affairs needs to be part of this is the requester even thinking about something like that? Uh, and this may cause them to think, so of course we don't wanna rush them as they ponder some of your questions so they can give you a thoughtful answer. And again, we've gotta be open to the fact that they may not know, but they may suspect that there is somebody, but they may not know who that is exactly or what organizational entity would be part of uh, the source for that kind of insight. Um, and so again, we're just trying to understand, you know, when we go to develop this, who might we be involved with? Where will we get the information? Who can test this out in terms of whether or not we got it right? Is it going to be accurate, complete, and appropriate? Um, you know, who's, and who's going to say so? So does the requester have any of uh, that in mind? Um, you know, so uh, on the next page then, we want to understand, so what defines the beginning and end points for this project? Are we going to create something and hand it off to them? Or are we going to be involved in continual uh, delivery? Or is this something we're going to put uh, on the uh, uh, in the cloud someplace and so people can uh, access this uh, whenever they want? Or is that, is that going to be controlled access, et cetera? So, What's included in the scope? So now we're trying to figure out, you know, what's inside the box of the scope of the effort as they see it. You know, what might be borderline? It's always good to know what stands on the edge and maybe we're not too sure about that. And what's definitely outside the box, the scope of this. Um, maybe we don't have to recruit coaches or instructors. They already know who would be involved in doing that on their behalf. Um, but they may need support and development as well. And so, aha, not only is there some initial content perhaps to be developed, but there's going to be development, uh, maybe even certification of the people who are going to deploy this, deliver this, the instructors and coaches, facilitators, or again, whatever you might call these. Um, so, you know, so can we identify anything that needs to be explicitly excluded? Um, and so here's where we ask questions seeking information um, about such things. There's always going to be some level of development and sources and there's going to be some 
uh, ability to de deploy this or to make it accessible, and so what are the issues all surrounding all of that? Uh, what do they see as the specific deliverables? You know, do they know this is going to be a two-day event or a half-day event or um, a set of job aids? You know, what are what are their thoughts specifically, or is it a combination of things? Um, you know, how many iterations might we go through? Now, this is where we're perhaps asking them to guess, but if it's tricky, uh, sticky content, they may uh, identify that, you know, one, you know, one pass won't certainly do, and we may need to do three or four passes here as we run the gauntlet to get the information, review it, uh, layer more information into uh, whatever we produced initially, et cetera, et cetera. So they may be thinking about that. They may have some familiarity with how things are developed. Um, most people in businesses have their own things that they have to develop, and they're running through a gauntlet of reviews, updates and reviews and updates. And so what are their thoughts regarding all of this? Uh, is there software, uh, tools and equipment that are, would be involved in this thing? We need to understand all of that. Um, and we can wrap up on the next page then with, you know, who's going to own the ongoing maintenance of the deliverables? Is that part of the scope? We create something, you know, if it's volatile content, it's going to need to be maintained. If it's not volatile and will be good, you know, from here on out with rare exception, then that's less of an issue. So those are the things that we're trying to tease out and understand because not only are there first costs to develop instructional content of any means, uh, of any mode and mean media, um, but there might be life cycle costs associated with this too. And so we want to understand that. Um, you know, what key methods might be involved here? Is it gonna be just literature search? Are we gonna be searching through the organizational's resources and documentation to extract uh, and cull from to get content? You know, what what are their thoughts? Again, they may not have answers to all of this. We just wanna know what do they know and what don't they know? And they may not come prepared with all of that specifically in mind. And these are the questions that we might use to tease all that out. Of course, the questions that I'm giving here need to be probed further depending on what the answers are. So, you know, if you've never done anything like this before, don't go too fast. Uh, tell the people that you're interviewing that you may have to swing by again for another uh, Q&A session with them to fill in the blanks. Um, if you've done this dozens and dozens of times, then you probably have less need for that because you can anticipate some of the gray areas and you can probe appropriately and uh, shorten the whole life cycle on this. The next page is about project scope and deliverables, approach and roles. You know, so we can now, do we have these items in mind, who the sponsors are, the pro who will be the project manager, who might be on some sort of a project steering team, on analysis and design teams, if we're gonna do the team approach or whether that's been excluded and we're gonna have a team of master performers and subject matter experts perhaps, but we're not gonna be able to meet with them as a team. We're gonna to have to meet with them one-on-one -on -one individually. And so we need to understand that. Uh, if we have identified all of these roles, and again, this follows my standard approach, my roles as I define them and use them. And of course, yours may vary. But I want to know if then, well, you know, so who are we going to give this? Who's going to be directing, approving, rejecting? Who's going to review? Who's going to provide input, et cetera? These are the key things from my perspective. When I'm planning a project, I'm going to put a price to it. These are the things that I'm thinking about um, and um, want to kind of pin down as soon as possible. Now, again, this is about talking to the requester. This is also then the same document that I would use to go talk to the various stakeholders and sponsors for this request. Um, and by the time I'm done talking to all of the appropriate parties, I'm probably going to have a good sense as to whether or not they're all on the same page, pretty much, or whether they're all over the place and everybody's thinking about this in very different means. And of course, that just increases the challenge for documenting a project plan and getting signed off and approved. And when people just tell you, yeah, yeah, that's a fine project plan and that's all fine, and you know that there's a bunch of divergence in thought about this effort, um, you're going to have to work uh, harder, more diligently to make sure that you have a consensus, agreed upon consensus about how to conduct the project.
because you want to know that and find that out and figure that out and nail it down as soon as possible, hopefully before you start, because otherwise you're going to blow schedules and budgets doing this if you're going to be running around in circles, uh, revisiting the same thing over and over and over again, because everybody's thinking about this differently. So you need to bring them to consensus at some point. The next page then, staff backgrounds and project tasks, assignments and schedules. This is where we're thinking about this ourselves. The stakeholders include on the supply side, the L&D organization or training and development or ISD or LXD. Um, and so who's gonna be doing what and what kind of backgrounds do they have? Are they rookies that have never done this before? This will be their first outing going solo or are they seasoned veterans? We need to know that when we're crafting a project plan because a seasoned veteran takes less time and less iterations on things than a rookie. And when we're figuring out here's the task time, well, we give more task time to the rookie than we do the seasoned veteran to do any particular task. Um, uh, with some of exception, of course, but then, then what kind of cycle time? So if we'd said, okay, that's going to take a seasoned veteran a day to do, we're going to give two days to the rookie, but then the rookie may need to go and get reviews and do more updating and, you know, to get it closer to Nirvana perfection. And we need to give more cycle time for touch time because the plan might be to go do something and get it reviewed and then update it. And we're going to have to give more touch time and more cycle time to the rookie than to the seasoned veteran. So again, it's helpful to understand as you're doing a project plan as to, you know, who's going to be involved and maybe you taking the request get to make those decisions and perhaps not. Perhaps that's an organizational decision that uh, you don't get to make, but that you have to go figure out as you're doing the project plan. And of course, if you're being asked to do a detailed project plan, and if you're a consultant, put a price to it, and you don't have the answer as to who the players are on the supply side, then that's going to be a huge issue. So we're really trying to understand the customer side of things and the supplier side of things here so that we can go forward. Um, we need to be able to summarize, you know, what's this project going to cost? And in my uh, approach to these kinds of things, I try to do everything fixed fee as a consultant, but there are times when the th project is too fuzzy and I can't be very predictive or predictive enough for me to put a fixed fee on things. So I may have to do this estimated time and expense is how it's often referred to. So is that the route I'm going to? Is that my notes here is where the requester or working with the people that will actually sign off on the project plan, you know, how are we going to get back to the client. You know, sometimes in an organization, in an enterprise, it's called blue money. You know, there's just, you're on the payroll as a support organization to do the requests that come into you after perhaps some screening, perhaps not much screening, but there's no charge back to the requester. And sometimes there is. And so this is for when we've got uh, requesters um, that are going to get charged back. So if we have to give them, this is what it's going to cost you. Is it fixed fee or is it time and expense? Um, everybody loves fixed fee because that kind of, you know, settles one thing down, but estimated time and expense projects, they have to be managed more carefully. And the customer side needs to understand that they could be a contributor to the estimated costs, the price tag being exceeded because of their own behaviors. Um, and, you know, if you've got a lot of experience, you could probably warn them about what are those behaviors that drive costs beyond the initial estimates, or is it poor estimating on the part of the supply side? Again, that always varies. So uh, we need to understand, I like to understand, you know, what are the number of days involved for this person and that person when they're playing various roles? Maybe I'm going to have an analyst who's going to also be the designer, but the development team is is staffed by a different group of people. Maybe the analyst is a designer, is also a developer, the lead developer, and they have other people that are being brought in. So again, it's just uh, part of leading to developing a detailed project plan where you're trying to not just guess, but guarantee a schedule for conducting the project and what are the major milestones and when are we gonna hit them and when are we gonna all be done and hand it over uh, for ongoing access or deployment, et cetera. So these are the things that we need to consider. Uh, what about travel and living costs? Are we concerned with those or are we not concerned with those? 
uh, what kind of materials and breakdown, who's going to pay for the printing, all of those kinds of things here. Are there uh, extraordinary support services that need to be thought of and considered? Now again, all of this feeds a detailed project plan, and I've got articles and books that address this and go into some level of detail on that. But I break my uh, project plan into, the, into eight different sections. The first one is a short and sweet purpose, a purpose statement. Uh, number two then gives a little bit of background as to, you know, why we're doing this and why now, what's the big deal, you know, what's at stake. It, it, hopefully it's high stakes performance and not low stakes performance with mass appeal. What's the scope of this? What's inside the box? What's outside the box? What's borderline on the edge? What do we know about all that? What approach are we taking? Are we going to be facilitating teams of master performers and other subject matter experts? Are we going to be doing more of a traditional one-on-one -on -one uh, interviews, observations, and document reviews? Or are we going to do some mixture combination of all of that? What are the various project phases and milestones? I have my own standard for all of this. It's an addy like approach, but yours may be different. So how can you tell the client when you're going to have something for them to review and approve or modify or reject? You know, and what are the stages or phases that you're going to go through? And can you uh, outline that for them? What are the specific outputs and deliverables? Are we all clear on what's going to be produced and then when it's going to be produced and using what means to produce it? Seven are the roles and responsibilities. So I like to be very clear about what's on the customer side, what's on the supplier side, who's going to do what, when they're going to do it. And that leads into the next section, a project tasks, roles, and schedules. I often call these task time charts. Uh, and here's an example of it, but it identifies the task, it identifies the players on the supply side and the players on the customer side, and who's going to be involved in each specific task set or task, and what, how much, what's the burden on them? And I do this in quarter days, so 0.25 is the lowest I go to of a, of a day, so that I can estimate what's the burden on the people. This is especially important on the customer side that they understand that besides paying a price or if it's blue money, that there is a cost to them, the time and effort of their people. And then I schedule not every single task, but the key tasks, especially where customer people are gonna be involved. And it's, it's a critical set of dates. I don't put dates on every last task that's too crazy, uh, and this is crazy enough. Anyway, this is Guy Wallace, and that's how I approach detailed project planning using a customer and stakeholder interview guide. Thank you.